How y'all doing? Welcome to Silent. Good afternoon and welcome. Um, as most of you know, my name is Dan Attridge, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Dean of the Law School. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you all to our special event today. Uh, today's event is part of our St. Pope John the 23rd lecture series, which began in our law school back in 1965. Uh, this series invites outstanding professionals from various fields who've made a contribution to public life to share their perspectives on a wide variety of current topics. Uh, on the back page of your program, you will find a listing of speakers who've addressed us as part of this series in previous years. Our special guest today, as you probably know, is the Honorable R. Alexander Acosta, who serves as the Secretary of Labor. Secretary Acosta has had a remarkable career in public service, in academia, and in the private sector. Besides his current position, he served as a member of the National uh, Labor Relations Board, as an Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, and as the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Florida. He's the former Dean of Florida International University College of Law, and has also taught as an adjunct law professor at George Mason University. And early in his distinguished career, he and I had a pleasure of working together. Well, I'll let him comment on how pleasurable he found it uh, as an attorney at Kirkland Ellis in Washington, D.C. With the Secretary's permission, our format today will be an informal conversation instead of a more formal lecture. I will be asking the Secretary a series of questions on a variety of topics that I hope will be of interest to you. Uh, we're quite fortunate that he's willing to share his expertise and thoughts with us. Please join me in welcoming Secretary. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I want to begin by asking you about your very interesting personal background. Um, as uh, some people know, your parents immigrated to the United States from Cuba. You grew up uh, in Miami, Miami, and then you went on the very prestigious institution of Harvard University where you got your two degrees. So we've got this picture of someone who's rooted uh, in the human uh, community of Miami, but also has the elite prestige factor of Harvard. I'm just wondering at the beginning, how have these uh, cross-cultural influences um, uh, brought to, uh, how they shape the perspective that you bring to the Department of Labor? Sure, um, you know, I, um, I just came from a, a meeting uh, at the department, um, we have regional uh, directors from around the country, 10 regional directors uh, with us today. And they said, what's it like to go to the State of the Union? And, um, and I said, you know, you've got to take a step back and realize there are not many places where the son of um, two individuals that didn't go to college um, that, that left high school to work uh, ends up in the State of the Union address, right? And, um, and that is something that I think I'm, I'm deeply aware of at all times and, um, and really informs how I look at things. And so, you know, I was uh, just sort of bring this forward to, to a, a job experience. I was um, in a coal mine in West Virginia and, um, you know, I went down into the mine um, and, and, and sort of went, you know, 30 minutes to, to the, the mine front. And, um, you know, when I travel with me now, um, uh, security comes along. And um, one of the individuals with me um, uh, chose to come on that trip because his father had worked as a coal worker. And he wanted to understand what his father's life was like. And um, that's something really, I think, unique that we all have to remember that, that you're all in law school, but that at some point someone's making it so that you can be here in law school. And, um, you know, for me, I, I now have two, two little girls. And one of my concerns is this. I learned to work incredibly hard because I knew what my parents gave up for me. Will my girls see that same level of sacrifice? You know, think of what you're, some, for some of you, don't, I mean, I don't mean this in an aggressive way, but for some of you, your parents are paying tuition, but it's not changing their life. 
But for others, the fact that you are here is an incredible sacrifice on their part. Although you all have loans, so maybe it's not that much of a sacrifice. <laughs> but at some point they've sacrificed for you. And what kind of obligation does that put on you to really take that responsibility seriously? And when you're thinking, do I go out or do I study? <laughs> you know, how do you balance that? And um, as a father, that's something that I really worry about um, when you know I'm, I'm raising my girls and when my wife and I are raising our girls because that's something that I, I learned and felt growing up and, um, and something that's hard to transfer along generations. Well, as a dean, I'm glad to hear you're telling our students to study. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I, I, I figure that's important here, right? <laughs> okay. So let me ask you about your clerkship with Judge, uh, now Justice Alito, on the Third Circuit. Um, can you tell us uh, uh, what you took away from that experience? Any special memories you have of it? So, um, you know, Justice Alito is an incredibly capable, genuine, caring individual and something that you know for me it, you know it was an extension of a family and and he views his clerks as extended family and and that's something that i think is sometimes lost um on the public um a clerkship if you have the opportunity to do one is incredible and anyone that's thinking of going into litigation should try a clerk um, Taking a step back from that, and again, sort of putting on my, my hat as a dean, you know, I, I think it's really interesting because one of the issues that I see with higher education is uh, more and more the teaching has turned toward the, the theoretical. And um, in, in higher education, sometimes says we should teach the practical. And once upon a time, that was filled by practitioners. And so I learned so much from clerking. You know, I, I know how Justice Leader writes. I, I figured out his style. His writing style influences my writing style. Um, when, I, when I started at a law firm, you know, I learned so much from those first few years at the law firm. But now more and more, judges don't want to take the time to train. Law firms say, if they're going to just stay with us for two or three years, why should we invest? And so it's putting a lot of pressure on law schools and on universities to teach those practical skills. So I, um, you know, this affects my current job in the following way. Um, you know, I, I'm curious. So a Catholic, how many, how many students at the university? Not the law school, anyone know? Oh, at, the, at the whole university? Whole university. Um, Almost 7,000. 7,000. How many graduate? Um, about half. About half. Right there, that says a lot, right? And of those, how many get jobs? And, and so... They all get jobs. Uh, they all get jobs, right? <laughs> so, so one of, when. Yeah, so, so one of the really interesting questions is if you can do a semester abroad, why can't you do a semester at a police academy? Um, you know, if, if, if a clerkship has value, why is there no value working at a law firm? And should that be part of an academic experience? Because a clerkship for me was an incredible learning experience. And my time at a law firm was an incredible learning experience. And I would not be here but for those. So should those be considered as part of a course of study? And, and I, I think as, you know, it's something that faculties need to think about. So let me ask you about yeah. Kirkland Ellis, where we uh, worked together. We worked together. I was an associate, Dan. The Dean Attridge was uh, was a partner. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, we worked on some matters together, we litigation, did. labor, employment matters. I certainly very much enjoyed working with you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether you have a similar view of that. <laughs> I'd like you, like you to comment on that. And I think you <laughs> so I thought of, I, I, as we sat down, I thought of it, and, and I thought of a story um, that I've actually told students, and, um, and, and so I remember I, uh, I pulled an all-nighter, I was uh, writing a brief, I think it was a summary judgment brief, and, um, and for some reason I remember I wasn't wearing shoes, 
because uh, it was late at night, and at some point you take off your shoes and walk around in socks, right? And um, I was really proud of this document. And, and I go into the dean's office, and I hand it to him. And there was a typo on the front page. I, I doubt you remember this. Um, Probably remember you're not wearing shoes. Uh, but um, um, uh, your dean uh, was rather vociferous in, um, in, in that. And, and his point was, if it's not proofread to the point that you allowed a typo on the first page, how do I know that you paid attention in the rest of the document? And, and for me, that was an incredible learning experience that, um, and as much as I took away legal analysis from working at Kirkland, um, one of the things that I really took away is attention to detail. And law school does not teach that. No. But um, in the real world, it is so important because you can have the best thought through document but if they're typos, if it's sloppy, people will question your attention to detail. And it's not that it's superficial, but it's that it reflects how thoughtful and careful you are, and it's a quick way for people to judge you. And, um, and so one of, you know, I, I, I say this to, uh, and I would say this to my former students all the time, because that attention to detail is a skill that is incredibly important and rarely taught. So at the time I was rather ticked, but uh, but it was a very but it was a very very good learning experience for me. Uh, if my recollection is correct, one of the cases we worked on together was a labor matter in which our co-counsel was the now Chief Justice of the United States, John that, Roberts. That's correct. Am I recalling that correctly? You, you are recalling that correctly, and it uh, had to do with. Uh, Replacement players, if I recall. Yes. yes. Um, did uh, you, you have any memories of that, with, with or without shoes? Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so I, I do recall that one of the, um, you know, it's interesting because one of the reasons that that I I moved into the public sector is a realization um, that when um, the NFL or the NFL Players Association hires Kirkland. Uh, or hires uh, at the time, I think it was. Um, he Probably was Covington. Yes. Yeah, uh, he wasn't at Covington. He was, uh, John Roberts was at. Uh, oh, he was at Hogan. At Hogan. Yeah. Uh, they're not hiring Kirkland to have Alex Acosta, the associate, work on the case. Uh, they're hiring uh, Kirkland or Hogan to have Dan Attridge or John Roberts work on the case, right? And, um, and so. I was involved in that. I certainly wrote the first draft. Um, uh, a fellow by the name of Chris Landau, uh, he used to, used to use a purple pen, and uh, he edited heavily. And, and you know, one one piece of advice that 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 I have when you're working with a good writer, look at how he or she edits. Because to this day, I remember that he changed the word also to likewise. And likewise has a subtly different meaning than also. Mm. And I learned from that, and now when I think about it, I use also when I mean also, when I use likewise when I mean likewise. And, and, and so uh, I learned a lot from, from Chris's editing. But um, you know, I also learned that there's me, and then there's you know, the junior partner, and then the senior partner, and the person arguing the case. And, and so I chose uh, pretty early on to go into the public sector, which um, you know, I have found very fulfilling. So I had a student that, um, that called me last week, um, and he had a choice between uh, Shook Party, which is a, a fairly large firm, and going to work as a counsel for ATF. And I think he's going to go for a counsel to, to go work at ATF. And the way I, I sort of laid it out for him is there's pecuniary and non-pecuniary benefits to, to a job. And if you go to work at Shikardi, he was going to be working on some major class action litigation. If you know Shikardi, you probably know what he was working on. Um, you know, I basically said, you're probably not going to see the inside of court for a long, long time. But if he goes to ATF, he's going to get a lot of legal action and analysis. And um, on the one hand, working with, with John Roberts was, was very fulfilling, and I 
I had the opportunity to work on a lot of appellate briefs. Um, on the other hand, it makes you realize that you're pretty low down and it's gonna be a long, long time before you have access to a court. Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I didn't hear you say how much you liked working with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, so. <laughs> But I'll, yeah. but I'll, I'll yeah. take that, yeah. I'll take that, thank you. So uh, let, uh, let me, you, you were at the Civil Rights Division of the Justice yeah. Department, I know you did two stints there. Uh, any, any thoughts about that experience? Um, so, you know, one of the things that I'd say is, um, working in government, you realize that folks in government work really hard, and you know, those that haven't been in government uh, make assumptions, and then I think those assumptions are far too broad-based. Government lawyers work really hard. They work as long as private sector lawyers. They're as talented as private sector lawyers. Um, the issue uh, really is, do you want to work in an area where you get to a lot more discretion, and that tends to be government, or less discretion and more pay? Um, and so for me, being in the division taught me a lot about uh, government service. You know, it also uh, makes you take a step back and really think about things. And so I had some pretty incredible experiences. I, um, we were um, on um, Dr. Martin Luther King Day, we were previewing a film. And, um, and so I talked a little bit in advance of the film about going down to Selma. And, um, and having the opportunity to, does anyone know about the Edmund Pettus Bridge? And okay, I saw three, three uh, heads or hands nod and uh, maybe four or five, and uh, most of them tend to probably be what all some are not the students. Um, 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 <laughs> and um, and so, so this had to do with a, um, a famous march. And, um, and so we reenacted the march, and, and you're at this uh, church, I think it was Brown Chapel, and you go left down to a river, and then you walk a few walks, and then you get to this bridge. And during the Civil Rights era, it was a famous march because there was a sea of, of police with dogs and batons, and people felt so strongly that they marched into that sea of violence yet they marched. And the point that I made at the department is, you know, it's hard for those of us of my generation or the younger generations to really fully understand what that must have been like. So you know you're gonna be bashed in the head with a baton and you keep marching. How many of you would really do that? How many of you feel so strongly about something that you would do that? But they did. And, and, and being in the division caused me to take a step back and think about a lot of those things. And that matters. And, and you know, my point was that history matters because times have changed. But when, when discussed in that context, it really informs a lot of the understanding of some of the tensions that we have today. And so that's something that I've taken with me. So uh, another stint you did in government, you were the U.S. Attorney uh, for the Southern District of Florida. And uh, according to some media reports I've pulled up, and I don't know whether this is accurate or not, that's why it's true to me, your office was involved in prosecuting the lobbyist uh, Jack Abramoff, mm -hmm. uh, Swiss Bank USB, a terrorist uh, suspect Jose Padilla, uh, the founders of the Cali drug cartel and numerous uh, Medicare fraud cases. Um, any thoughts on, on your time as U.S. Attorney? So the Miami office is one of the larger U.S. Attorney's offices in the country. They're, they're a handful of what they call the extra large offices, New York, um, L.A., Miami, Washington, um, are some of the particularly large offices. And we had some very high profile cases. Um, one of the great things about being a U.S. attorney is, you know, I'll analogize it to, you can be a very high-ranking officer in the Pentagon, but 
a lot of what you do has to do with Washington. Being that same rank or slightly lower rank in the field means you have your own command. And there's an analogy to be drawn there to a U.S. Attorney's offices versus what they call main DOJ, where um, in a U.S. Attorney's office, in a very real way, you are involved in cases, in the day-to-day -day prosecution of matters. Your job is not to make policy at a national level, but really to, to prosecute, to execute the laws. And, um, and so we were, you know, we had some major matters. If you've, you've seen Narcos, um, the gentleman of Cali, uh, the Rodriguez Arola brothers, um, you know, a, a multi-billion dollar forfeiture. Uh, UBS, we were the, uh, the office that, that handled the UBS case, where for the first time in history, um, the Swiss turned over a uh, undisclosed number of individual names that were committing tax fraud. And uh, the Swiss actually had to change their laws to do that. And, um, and, and that's really interesting because I'm not aware of any other time when the Swiss have actually changed their bank secrecy laws to turn over the names of individuals. And since then, um, you know, you've had a number of, of changes in the way bank secrecy uh, proceeds. Um, so that's something that I thought was very important. And then after that, um, the IRS uh, started a program where folks would come in and say, yes, I committed uh, tax evasion or tax fraud, pay the fines, pay the taxes, and they brought in billions and billions of dollars, um, you know, prosecuted terrorism cases, prosecuted um, um, Chucky e. Taylor, uh, AKA Charles Taylor Jr., um, who uh, was the head of the Liberian security forces and prosecuted him for torture. Uh, he flew through Miami and he was arrested. And that was an interesting case because we had to deploy our uh, AUSAs to Liberia to gather evidence with the agents. Um, it was also a challenging case because he committed the crimes in Liberia against Liberian nationals while head of the Liberian security forces. And, and so that presented some unique, um, some unique legal challenges that, that we had to address. Um, and so, um, you know, those were cases, I, I remember the, uh, you know, during uh, the Taylor case, we received a question that um, the jury, the jury, you know, we received notice the jury had a question. And um, I'm thinking, wow, I thought we had a pretty good case. What does the jury want to know? And the jury wanted to know if one of the prosecutors could sign the indictment. And um, at that point, we all we, we knew what the outcome was going to be. It was pretty obvious. Um, but uh, if any of you have seen Blood Diamonds, you've got an idea of what was going on in, in Liberia at the time. So some pretty heady cases. Um, let me move forward to your deanship at Florida International. Yeah. Um, ask you about uh, that experience. And one thing I thought I'd ask you to comment on: um, uh, 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 Justice Scalia uh, gave a number of speeches during his career. There's a book out that was just published that collected his speeches. I don't, you probably haven't seen it. But once upon a time, he was a candidate for my position as dean here uh, at Catholic University. And um, one of his mentors said, you probably don't want to do that because being the dean of a law school is like being a zookeeper with open cages. <laughs> so uh, any thoughts on so, uh, so being a fellow zookeeper I, for a while? I loved it. Um, I loved it. Uh, like, like your dean, I'm what, uh, I was what you call a non-traditional dean in that uh, I came from practice. And um, I very much enjoyed it. Um, you know, my approach, um, uh, you know, and I, I think sometimes non-traditionals will approach uh, deaning differently is, you know, the faculty has a critical, critical role and, um, and faculty scholarship really matters. Um, and, and the dean needs to and should support that entirely. Um, at the same time, the students and, and, and employment rates um, and, uh, and mentorship also matter, and there's an equal obligation of that front. And, and so I, I took a very personal interest in, in many of those 
And you know, I was very proud. We had very strong employment numbers. Very strong employment numbers. Um, we were number one in the bar multiple years out of twelve schools. And so here you have FIU that was initially unranked and ended up being top one hundred uh, within a matter of about five years. Uh, go from typical bar scores to ahead of University of Florida, ahead of FSU, ahead of University of Miami, and. Um, you know, for me, that's the right balance for, for fact. And one thing that I did, which I thought was interesting, is um, I asked the faculty to not teach to the bar. Um, and I asked the faculty to, to not teach to the bar exam on the theory that faculty think up here, the bar is down here. And so the teaching that occurs is about thinking, whereas the bar is about how to take multiple choice. But then we set up a four credit class that was exclusively and unapologetically about prepping for the bar in the third year. And, and that was, you know, for our faculty, a great trade off because they didn't have to worry about the bar as much. And for the students, it got them thinking about the bar exam uh, a little bit early. And, um, and so that was, you know, a really, the, you know, I, I think it was part of my approach to, to sort of, there's, there's theory and there's practice. There's, you know, lifelong learning, but also you got to pass this darn test or, you know, why you're taking out all the loans. And, um, and, and so I wish the academy was more open to traditional, uh, to non-traditional deans. Um, if you look at medical schools, it's, it's pretty common. Um, and in me the medical schools have really integrated practice and teaching in a way that, that law schools haven't. Um, and so I think it's unfortunate folks think it's anti-intellectual to integrate the two because you can't argue that a medical school is anti-intellectual. Um, uh, I think if anything, it frees up the faculty to do um, more scholarship to, to integrate. Let's uh, move over to the Labor Department. Last April, you were sworn in as the 27th Secretary of Labor. Um, why were you interested in serving in the role? So, um, first and foremost, I think having the ability to, to really impact people matters. And let me come at it this way. You will work more hours in any given day, week, month, or year, and you'll realistically sleep, and you'll spend with your significant other, um, and your family, if, if, if you work the hours I work, that, that's certainly the case. If you work the hours your dean works, that's certainly the case. And having positions that make you feel good, that, that make you feel like you're having impact, I think is invaluable. And earlier when I was talking about the pecuniary versus non-pecuniary compensation of jobs, you can have jobs that pay more, but if you have a job that fulfills you, that goes a long, long way. And, and I've been a deep believer in government service. I think it's really important to, to serve the public. This nation's done incredible things for me, and, and giving back, I think, is, is important. Um, my background's an interesting background for a labor secretary. Because if, if you sort of take a step back, what does you know a labor secretary do? To some extent, we enforce OSHA, MSHA, workplace safety, wage and hour. Those are enforcement jobs. Cite U.S. Attorney. Labor policy. Well, I was a member of the National Labor Relations Board, and so you've got the, the, the labor policy part of it. Um, a lot of what I do is um, I'm, I've thought pretty hard about workforce development. And that's really the third part of the, the labor secretary's job. How do we think about developing the, the, the workforce? You know, we've got, on the one hand, a 4.1% unemployment rate. That is really low. That's the lowest it's been in 17 years. And the Federal Reserve is estimating that it's going to go from 4.1% down to 3.9%. You know, that's the lowest. I don't know if it's in 20 years and 30 years. But that, that, that's really good. On the other hand, if you look at the labor force participation rate, 
It's about what 62.9, give or take uh, a few point ones. Um, and, and that's the number of people that are actually working versus the total population to oversimplify a little bit. And that's not as high as it has been in the past. And it's a lot lower than a lot of other developed nations. So we're going from five uh, folks working for every retiree in the 1960s to about two and a half folks working for every retiree. And, and, and that really says something. And so the question is why? Well, you know, right now we have six million open jobs in the United States. And if you talk to CEOs, they say we cannot fill these jobs. And I'd say part of it has to do that our education system isn't keeping up with changes. And, and so, you know, we all have iPhones or Androids or something. Um, I actually don't have one on me right now, which is making me nervous. <laughs> um, but uh, we're all used to carrying them around. Those are barely 10 years old. Think of how much things have changed. Now ask how much has the curriculum changed? You know, when the dean uh, was the partner that I was working for, I learned a lot and I enjoyed it. Um, you know, um, thank you. Email was brand new and most partners were not using email. He was, but most partners were not. Think about that, right? And, and so is education changing and keeping up and keeping pace? And, and so being a dean really gives me a fascinating insight into workforce development. So for example, we have uh, an assistant secretary of Department of education for vocational education. And then I have money that I spend on workforce development. What's the difference? Shouldn't education be involved in developing lifelong learning and lifelong earning? And is there an obligation on the part of education to make sure not only that folks learn how to think, but that they learn the skills necessary to walk into a job? So, um, so being, you know, having been a dean, having been involved at the NLRB on labor policy, and having been an enforcement official, in a sense is a unique combination that um, I think allows me to, uh, to really think about labor policy broadly and in an impactful way. So on, on workforce development, what are the possible options available that the department might explore? So one of the, the things that we're looking at is apprenticeship uh, programs. And so these are very common in Europe. And the question is, are they more, should they be more common here? So um, let me explain what those might be. Um, let's say someone's a pharmacy tech and they want to be a pharmacist. Do they need to go back to college to learn to be a pharmacist? Or if Walgreens, Rite Aid, and CVS put together a program, should there be a way for them to finish their pharmacy tech job, stay an extra hour at the workplace, go online, and learn the skills necessary to move from pharmacy tech level one to pharmacy tech level two to pharmacist eventually? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe a pharmacist you know, it's such a unique position that you need to go through a four-year degree in a traditional sense, but maybe not. And, and should we have more accessibility to alternative paths to, um, you know, to, to employment? I, um, you know, when, when I talk to, to university officials, I, I like to sort of um, cite Raphael. It makes me, it sort of puts me in the, the university mindset. There's a famous fresco called the School of Athens, if any of you have seen it. It's got all the great philosophers and, 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 and Western thinkers, um, and they're all standing, pondering, and thinking. Now, the problem is that they did it all live at the same time, uh, and, and that fresco is entirely unrealistic, but it is sort of the archetypical view of what a university should be. But I like to say that in ancient Athens, for every philosopher, you had a stonemason, and you had a woodcrafter, and you had folks that made life possible. And so you couldn't possibly have a society where everyone was a philosopher, and no one was a stonemason or a woodcrafter or a farmer. 
And have we gotten to the point in society where we want everyone to be that philosopher and we're teaching everyone to be that philosopher? We put it in a law school context. Law school teaches everyone assuming you're going to be an appellate lawyer. Um, you know, it's all about the cases and the, you know, and, and so, you know, here's some secrets. I tell folks, take administrative law because administrative law is going to be much more relevant to a lot of occupations than, um, than, than some of the, the, the more niche courses. Um, you know, um, if you're going to corporate law, uh, you know, the case method might not be the best way to learn corporate law. Have we rethought that? Um, you know, are we teaching everyone to be a philosopher or are we recognizing that, that there are different sets of skills? Um, so a few, a, a few things. I was talking to the governor of, of, of a major state who pointed out that the median salary for a welder is actually higher than the median salary for a lawyer. And you don't have to spend seven years in school or more. And you don't have to take out the debt. Now here's a question. Do we honor the welder? Do we, or do we as a society, have we gotten to the point that we're so elitist that we're judging a person because they want to be a welder that we're discouraging someone from being a welder? Um, or do we say, look, it doesn't matter what you do, we're going to not judge you by what you do, but by who you are. And if you have a family-sustaining job, that's what should matter. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's a really, that's something we need to think about. Um, let me uh, ask you to explain to us who are not insiders in the world of labor and employment yeah. law, how the Department of Labor and the NLRB and the EEOC and the various other entities interact with one another on labor and employment issues. Sure, so the NLRB is, call it a labor judiciary. Um, uh, when you've got uh, union disputes, it goes to the NLRB. You've got an administrative law judge that 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 um, that decides. They they hear a case, they decide the outcome, and then it's eventually elevated to the NLRB, where the five board members almost sit as labor judges, a, a sort of a labor court of appeals, appealing ALJ decisions. Um, the EEOC has a slightly different structure, but in, th in theory and concept, there's an analogy to be drawn there. And those are separate from the Labor Department. The Labor Department is fully an executive branch agency. It's not an administrative agency. Um, and, and so the EEOC and the NLRB are both independent multi-member agencies um, that have bipartisan or uh, not bipartisan RD members uh, as opposed to a purely executive department agency. Um, let me ask you if, if you could comment on your view about the future of labor relations in the United States, whether that's organized labor, non-organized labor. Do, do, you, do you see the future um, being different from where we are now? So, so I do see the future being different. The question is how. Um, you know, I, I think organized labor has a very important role, and it has had an important role and should continue to have an important role. You know, I think one of the challenges is the workplace is changing. You know, I, I talked about, is education keeping pace? Another question is, are the laws keeping pace? And so in 1995, the Bureau of Labor Statistics did a very comprehensive survey around what's called the entrepreneurial economy or the gig economy, however, however you want to, uh, you know, to, to, to look at it. And it was a certain percentage. And in 2005, it was the same percentage. Um, so we're doing another survey now, and I'm willing to bet that that percentage has increased dramatically. The question is, have the laws kept pace? You know, is the employer-employee relationship the same? And so when, when I worked uh, at Kirkland, Kirkland spent a lot of money on something called NIDA, if I remember. At least I thought it was a lot of money. You could, you could correct me otherwise, but... Um, they still do. Yeah, so, so they still do. Most firms don't. But, um, but it was a lot of money to really teach us skills. That presupposes a certain long-term relationship. If they're investing in us, it presupposes we're going to be there long enough to pay back that investment or else why would they invest in us, right? And, and if you look at the employment relationships in terms of health care and, uh, and savings and so many others, the same applies. Um, 
but but that employment relationship is starting to break down. And so um, the question becomes, what does the future employment relationship look like? And do the laws need to adjust to take those into account? So I was uh, I was in Davos, and one of the panels was you know about technology, and um, I think folks are way too alarmist. You know, they talk about how technology is going to take away jobs. And, you know, I'd love to have someone write a paper on the history of this, because you could go all the way back to Ruskin and probably, you could probably go back to ancient Athens. I can't think of a fresco, but, but you could. <laughs> um, and at various points, you had philosophers talking about how technology takes away jobs. Um, and, and Ruskin wrote tons about that. And, um, and you know, there were some interesting writings in the 20s. Um, and at each point, technology actually added and improved the working conditions. So if you go out to the Rouge plant, um, sort of the archetypical Ford plant, they'll say that the assembly line is now a much safer place. The stress on the human body is less because you don't have all the force from the, the force guns. Now it's, it's a much gentler um, uh, system when you're putting on screws and otherwise. Um, and so I was talking with eBay, who pointed out that there are 20 million eBay marketplaces where folks can access a global market pretty much from their home. That's incredible opportunity to folks that want to do it. And I know law students that set up a practice, I discouraged it when I was dean, uh, but set up a practice from their bedroom, right? Um, when they said, we don't need an office, we can have a virtual office. That's pretty, that's incredible flexibility. But if more and more people are doing that, then where does the security come from in terms of healthcare and 401ks and so many other structures? And so, you know, my hope is uh, as the year progresses that we'll have a, a, a deeper and, and more th and hopefully thoughtful discussion on um, what, the employee, what the relationship should look like because it's difficult to update, but at some point, the laws around this need to be reconsidered. Um, let me ask you about a couple of the issues that are before the department. And I recognize the secretary, you may not be no, able to, to, to comment, but uh, uh, to the extent you can, I'd invite that. Um, during the Obama administration, the department issued a regulation that's known as the persuader uh, rule. And my understanding is that it required companies to disclose their initial contacts with outside consultants on how to respond to unionizing efforts. And since then, there's a federal court in Texas that issued an injunction against the regulation. And my understanding is the department has announced that it is considering rescinding the regulation. Can you comment on this situation? Um, sure, so it, it, it's in the rulemaking process, and so I should um, should exercise some care in commenting. But you know, I would note, and I, I noted this to the ABA, that the ABA wrote in, and, and the ABA that on, on these matters, um, is is at least neutral, um, but but often is perceived by some as favoring more uh, the prior administration, uh, whether factual or not. I'll leave it to individuals to judge. Wrote in uh, deeply concerned about this rule and about what it would mean to lawyers if lawyers had to disclose all you know who their, their client lists were, and not only their client lists but their partners' client lists and what it would mean to the uh, attorney-client relationship. You've, there's a difference between a, um, a, third, a, a direct disclosure and a third-party disclosure, and, and, and that's relevant in the context that, um, you know, if, if you're publicly representing someone, then everyone knows who you're representing because you're out there in public. But if someone calls you and asks privately for advice, what does it mean for a lawyer to have to say, you know, the dean called me and asked me for advice around X matter. Um, and and should, should a lawyer be forced to disclose that publicly? And, um, and so it's, it's an important rule that we're taking a close look at. But in your hypothetical, it is hypothetical. It is a complete <laughs> hypothetical. Okay. Yes. Um, another uh, issue that uh, I want to ask you about is during the Obama administration, the department issued the so-called fiduciary rule. Uh, that impose some new requirements on financial professionals who work with retirement plans or provide retirement planning advice. I understand that implementation of that rule has been delayed. 
Um, can you tell us where that stands? Sure. And this this was a uh, you know this is an interesting one and, and some some lessons to sort of pass along. So I looked at that rule, and and I felt that the standard as a legal matter needed to go forward, and the standard actually did go forward. Um, the enforcement mechanisms were stayed pending reconsideration, and um, and when it was written, the SEC had not fully participated, and and it was our view that the SEC should fully participate because DOL regulates investments, the SEC regulates investments, other agencies regulate investments, and there's certainly a value to communication among and among agencies in terms of how we we regulate. Um, the interesting lesson that I'll take on, on that is I, um, I did something unusual. I wrote an op-ed which was published in the Wall Street Journal laying out why uh, I was allowing the standard to go forward and then, um, and then later on I, I, I publicly discussed why I thought the, um, there was an NPRM that should be considered in terms of whether or not the, the enforcement mechanism should be stayed, which they've been stayed for uh, about 18 months. Um, and one of the important lessons to me was I was really glad that I wrote that op-ed because I, I try to be lawyerly. I, I try to sort of explain something fully. And sometimes the media loves that 30-second soundbite. And I discovered when I wrote it that some people were disagreed with the op-ed. They took position X. They took position Y. Um, some some banks said, "Why did you allow the standard to go forward?" Some people on the other side said, "Yay, you allowed the standard to go forward." Um, uh, at the back end of the rule, the, the positions were often reversed. Uh, why did you you know stay the eighteen months versus yeah you stayed the eighteen months? But um, what I found interesting is that. Folks sometimes read the op-ed two or three times or gave it to their lawyer and had their lawyer read the op-ed. And over time, my thinking became clear. And actually articulating the thought process in writing in a sort of in a longer thought piece as opposed to a quick press release I thought had value because it established a record that allowed things to percolate and develop and become better understood. And, and I think that's a great uh, lesson that can be applied to so many contexts. When you make a decision that's important, putting it in writing forces you to really think it through. Um, in, in August, you announced that uh, the late President Ronald Reagan would be inducted into the department's Hall of Fame. Of course, he was a former actor and a uh, lifetime member of the AFL-CIO. Um, but at the same time, while he was president, organized labor criticized him for firing the uh, striking air traffic uh, controllers. Uh, could you give us your perspective on? Sure, and, 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 and you know, I, I also put this out in a set of remarks. Um, the Labor Hall of Fame is designed to recognize great labor leaders. President Reagan was President of the Screen Actors Guild, he actually was not just president, but he did a lot of things that changed the way Hollywood worked. So if you all see residuals, or do you all know what residuals are? Mm -hmm. He's the one that made it, that actually wrote the residuals into the contracts. All the residuals that are paid today started with him forcing that issue at the bargaining table in Hollywood, right? And so, some may disagree with what he did as president. That's fine. But don't take away from someone the fact that he actually was not just a labor leader, but that he changed the structure of an industry. And, and you know, I think you can recognize someone for A, while at the same time say, B is not my preference. As president, he thought he had an obligation. What he would argue that air traffic controllers did not have a legal right to strike and that he therefore should have acted and was enforcing the law. You can agree with that, you can disagree with that. But as president of the Screen Actors Guild, if you dig into it, he actually was a pretty transformative president. So uh, let me uh, ask you to comment just some on general attributes of public service. Obviously, you've had a chance to work with many dedicated and very successful public servants. And I was wondering if 
Are there any particular qualities that these people have that strike you as making for a great uh, public service or, or someone who you think of as a role model in the area of public service? So um, I think role models are, are dangerous types of questions. So let me let me come at it. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I just came from a meeting of ten regional directors of, in one of one of my uh, my departments, and I think so. This department is incredibly professional. They may agree with our policy positions. They may not. But I can't ask more of them in terms of having implemented our policy views with, uh, what's we're looking for, with, a, uh, with diligence. And so there is a humility that I think is really important in public service to understand that all of us occupy a chair. And for those of us that are political appointees, and, and maybe for deans as well, um, you know, we occupy chairs, we're supposed to lead, but it's about the chair that you sit in and not the position that you hold. And, and that you're there, you know, when you take the oath, it's, it's to the Constitution and to the laws and to um, well and faithfully execute the duties of the office in which you enter. And there's a humility to understanding that your job is to well and faithfully execute the duties as opposed to do what you want. And so circling back to the fiduciary rule, um, there was some controversy in that because my predecessor had written that rule. It was my view that the law required that I let the standard go forward whether I agreed with that standard or not. And that was required by the law. And that was my view of the law. Whether I agreed with that standard or not, that's what I was supposed to do. And, um, and that's what being a lawyer is about. Uh, separating yourself from what is required, but I think that's also what public service is about, understanding that it's not what Secretary Acosta wants, but what the law requires, and that it's your job to well and faithfully execute. Um, and I think that comes also with experience. Uh, <coughs> with respect to your experience as a dean, I wanted to ask if you had any advice for our students, uh, whether I appreciate the advice that they should study, but yeah. uh, beyond beyond their careers here at the law school, but as their legal careers, any any thoughts? Um, practical experience really matters. Um, you know, you're you're incredibly lucky because you're in Washington in a place that um, there's so many opportunities to get real practical experience. Um, and, and this time is going to go by so, so fast. Um, so I would talk to my students about investing in themselves. And, you know, I would start off by saying, you know, um, how many of you would take a job that paid X dollars an hour? And they'd all kind of raise their hands. And, I, and then I'd say, if there is an opportunity that is going to increase your lifetime salary by Y dollars, should you take it, even if that means you forego, you know, a, a job or a little bit of money now? And um, the answer is yes. We tend to sort of focus on, can I make ends meet now? You know, what's going to help me this semester? Um, whereas investing in yourself and in your human capital over a lifetime is going to be incredibly important. So, you know, if there are opportunities, I. Uh, I encourage people to take it. I, I'm, I'm thinking of very specific. I, I had a, a situation where um, the Women's Bar Association had invited a number of, of, of female law students to go to the lunch, but they couldn't comp the lunch. And so a number of students didn't go. And I'm like, why not? And they're like, well, it's $50. $50 is a lot of money to a student. 
$50 is also an evening out. Maybe a nice evening out, but it's still an evening out. So you can't afford it. If you're going out with friends, you can afford going to the Women's Bar Association lunch in downtown. And for your career, making those contacts is valuable and is an investment in yourself. Um, and so I think it's important to sort of um, follow what I call the lifetime theory of income, where you know it's it's about a lifetime and not a semester. So um, we're about up using our hour. Let me close this out with a couple of personal questions, sure. if I might. So um, we're at Catholic University, obviously a faith-based institution, and prompts me to ask, what role, if, if any, has your own faith played in your career? Um, so I think faith provides an important grounding. Um, Decision-making is sometimes hard. And knowing, knowing that there is a right and a wrong, knowing that one can find tranquility in doing what is right provides an important grounding and an important confidence that um, that I think is incredibly important. You know, we hold public trusts, and that means that you always have to do what you think is the right outcome, no matter what. And faith gives you the confidence to do the right because you know that at the end of the day, it's not about today or tomorrow, but it's about eternity. And it's important to always keep that in mind because that allows you to sort of, to serve. And um, interesting question. I, I think it's important. Uh, Work-life balance. You mentioned you're married. You've got uh, two daughters. Yeah. Given the heavy demands on your time, how do you have any semblance of a family life? So I, I just like the word, the phrase work-life balance. Um, and um, it implies a mutual exclusivity. And um, and I, I, think, I think words matter. And balance, I don't think sets up the right mindset because you can work hard and you can have an incredible family life. So actually, um, I have two little girls and I like to take them out separately so we can have quality time. And you know, later tonight we're going on a daddy-daughter date. Uh, my daughter's <laughs> seven, and um, and we're going out to dinner and we're going to sit down and put napkins in our lap and have a nice nice meal where we can talk. Um, and. It might be at 7, it might be at 8. She might be really excited because she gets to stay up really late because I might not be home till late 30 or 9. But it will happen. And for me, it's not an either or. It's a, if you are busy, you can make things fit. And so one of the things that you will find when you get to a law firm is that some of the busiest people are the ones that volunteer for other things that make time to to mentor that do all sorts of things because they don't view it as an either or they view it as a I do this and I do this and I do that and I do that and I just make it happen and um, and so I think family is incredibly important and um, you know I set aside time actually my schedule has personal time that is specifically set aside so that I can be with family. And I actually schedule it, which sounds crazy, but it, it makes sure that, that it's actually on the schedule um, and doesn't get uh, taken up. But it's not a balancing, it's an acknowledgement that there are many important things. And just like I will focus on an OSHA issue and I will focus on a wage and hour issue, I can have time to focus on several personal issues in my life. Uh, last question, come back to Cuba. Obviously, a lot has changed in our relationship uh, with Cuba since the time when your parents right. came to this country. Any, any thoughts on Cuba? Um, like so many others, I'm eternally hopeful that at some point freedom will come to Cuba. Um, 
And you know, it seems that the hope continues and continues and um, and changes hard. Um, I think it's important that we maintain maximum pressure so that um, so that at some point change can and will happen. And um, you know, I remain hopeful. All right. Uh, please join me in thanking Secretary. <laughs> have a uh, small token of our uh, appreciation. It has our logo on it, and we hope you will display it when you're in the presence of any prospective students. I will, uh, I'll run it by the ethics folks, but I think it qualifies. Okay. Thank you so much. This was fun. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Secretary, I think, I hope can stay for a few minutes out in the atrium if you would like to have a chance to, to say hello. Thank you.